Welcome to the Living Ageless and Bold podcast. Each episode, I bring you amazing women who inspire, educate, and share their experiences and journeys along the way. So grab a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's relax and have some fun hearing what can be accomplished after 55. Hey, listeners and viewers, today is just going to be an awesome episode. We are going to chat with Maria Bailey, who I met, I think, about 10 years ago, but we're going to talk about that. She is a best-selling author. She runs an incredibly successful marketing firm, um, BSM Media. And really what she does is she has built her entire brand on marketing to moms, which most of us are. Uh, so I'm excited to just chat with her um, on this episode. Welcome, Maria. Well, thank you, Christina. I'm so glad after 10 years, we get to finally meet on this platform. Um, I think, I think you were doing mom talk radio and I had invented my product, um, cosmetic designs, the, the fashion accessories for medical boots. And I think I was on your radio show. I think you were absolutely. I did that show for I hate to say this, but 25 years I did that radio show. So, wow. Um, in all wow. likelihood, you were one of the uh, many guests. So, I, wow. I know I've been and you were in your career for that long. So, I <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I would have asked you to have been on the show. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you. And you, did I read correctly? You were at one point also a lifetime TV host? I, I was. I had um, back in the early 2000s, I was hosting a show called The Balancing Act when I yep. had four children under the age of three. And oh. um, yeah, <laughs> and I was working in corporate America. So um, yes, I used to host that show on Lifetime. Wow. Okay. So what got you into, and you're a genius with this, you, and I always say, you know, in the media part of it, you know, niche the pitch right. and, and you honed in on a market on marketing to moms. How did you get into all of that? You know, Christina, don't you think that you find that perfect place in your career when your personal life collides with your professional life? And that's what happened for me. I actually had two children within five and a half months. And uh, if you try to do the math, um, you'll <laughs> ask me, well, how did you do that? I like only 3% of women have this happen to them, but I adopted and got pregnant at the same time. So I had my first two children five months and three weeks apart. And then I fortunately was blessed and got pregnant again. So I had three under 20 months. And at the time, I worked for AutoNation, which was the number one fastest growing car company company overall in America. So I was one of two female executives in the car industry with three children under 20 months. And what I noticed was when I had to go to a school play or such, all the guys in the office who were also vice presidents, just like me, they would just go out and tell their secretaries, because that's what you called them back then. Right, back then, of I, course. Oh my gosh, my wife is dragging me to this, you know, <laughs> preschool play. But I would go out and I would say that I had an out of the office meeting, right? Because I didn't want to associate children with why I was going to be out. And it dawned on me that no one was really talking to moms. And, you know, um, Faith Popcorn had written the book, Marketing to Women. And marketers just checked a box like, oh, she's a female. But in actuality, for all of the viewers and listeners, if you are a mom, you know, you never take that hat off. You're always you always have a filter with what you're buying wearing that mom hat. And so I started to write about it and uh, I caught the attention of Random House and they said, hey, tell me about this and why you think this. And then I did my research and, and moms in the United States control over $3.2 trillion in oh. annual spending. And, and so that's how I kind of, my, my worlds collided there. You discover this trillion dollar market for moms and then what, like what, 
how did you start to open the doors to, to, to really work in this space? I wrote my first book, which, you know, kind of makes you an expert, but you know, Christina, I'm sure that you have dealt with this as well. When you're trying to introduce a new way of thinking to essentially a bunch of men who are running marketing agencies and, and big brand advertising funds, it really, the only way that I could break through and make them understand that women with children controlled so much money and were, were buying the razors and the toilet paper in their house was I walked into a boardroom one day at a major brand and they're like, really like women, like moms, I don't get it. Why should we focus on them? And I looked around the table, there was only one woman sitting there. And I said, when was the last time you bought your own shaving cream? And all the men like looked at each other and they're like, yeah, kind of like, that's my wife. I mean, I, and then at another time, I went into the a boardroom of a major, let's say it's a mouse and pizza. And, um, <laughs> and again, we were talking about their marketing. Even they didn't understand that it was the mom that brought the kid to the birthday party there, right? And endured the bad food. I said to them, I'm like, have you ever looked for a tampon in the bathroom of one of your facilities? You don't even have a tampon machine. So guess what happens when a mom has to leave? She takes her children and her money out the door. And, you know, I really had to kind of come out of my shell and to illustrate to them that moms control a lot of money. So that's, and it took me about five years to, and, a, and two more books to get, to get, to get brands to understand, you know, that moms spend money, right? So, and you were really instrumental. I remember an, another thing we did together, maybe seven or eight years ago, is you were doing the social media moms tour for Disney. Right, right. And I know you had me on as a panelist. Yes. But that's brilliant to tie, you know, a brand like Disney with moms because just like you said, who's, who's planning the trip? Right. Who's- I mean, Christina, it was so funny. One time they brought me in as their consultant to help them sell moms on bringing their children to Disney. And I looked at them and I was like, okay, well, let's use mommy bloggers. At the time they were called mommy bloggers. Sure. Today they're called influencers. And I said, why don't we invite all of these mom bloggers here to Disney and we'll just give them like information and a back behind the scenes tour and all of that. And somebody... One of the men in in the room said, you think moms will pay to come here? And it was one of those, oh my goodness, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, and, and that event actually wound up um, being probably the pinnacle of my career. <laughs> we, they crashed the site. In fact, when we put it out on the web, to invite women to register to come and learn from Disney. And and it filled up, we had 500 spots. It filled up in a minute and a half and crashed the Disney website. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure moms will come to Disney. (laughs) Right. Oh my gosh. It's amazing, isn't it? So how do you feel through this time? Do you you feel like you've gotten through to some of these companies or are they... Are they listening to moms no, now? You know, you know what? They are. Well, they are in a way, but, you know, I I think about uh, Mother's Day recently and I look at the campaigns. I got a press release from uh, 1-800-Flowers, not to call them out, but 1-800-Flowers yep. sent out a press release. They were so excited about, they, they were on their website, a mom could, uh, or family members could go and using artificial intelligence, write a poem for mom for Mother's Day. And I saw this and I just shook my head because I said, if they had done their research, they would know what is the one thing that every mom wants besides to sleep in. They want just a simple card that's heartfelt from their children. Can you think of anything worse than... Going to a fake. AI and say, 
please create a poem for my mom. Like, no, they don't. Want- I, I had, I have a 23 year old and a 25 year old. And the, what they wrote in their cards oh. was I was sobbing right. to, to realize that, that I did okay. And that I have these, you know, adults now, that's all I want. And they, and they know that they're like, mom, we know you don't want anything. You want to be with us. And I was so lucky to be with my son in New York and then get home on Sunday to have dinner with my daughter oh, wow. and yeah. those cards, that's all I needed. It right. was, but you're exactly right. I, I do not want my, my son to say, Oh yeah, I went on a computer and I wrote, you know, I had AI write you a poem. Right. Exactly. So, so no, thank you. I'm not really sure that they, I think a lot of <sighs> brands just try to find the silver bullet and sometimes it fails because they don't, you know, a lot of times all you have to do is ask moms. I mean, we're full of opinions, right? <laughs> and, right. Uh, we're happy to okay. get into them. Yeah. So it surprises me still that they kind of miss the mark, you know? Well, I started this podcast, which is really geared towards women over 55, because I was getting frustrated that that they're not talking to us. Oh. They're really not. And then I started researching and found out that, you know, advertisers, it's 18 to 49. Yes. But then 98% of all luxury spending across the board for our kids and our parents and ourselves is done by us, women over 55. Absolutely. Uh, I I saw the greatest quote. It's like we're teenagers with money. Yeah. So we're healthy, we're wealthy, we're fit, we're fun, and nobody wants to sell us anything. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to start talking. We're not sexy, Christina. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm sexy, but apparently- I feel fantastic. I know. I feel better now than I did at 30. I, I totally agree with you. And it, it mystifies me because do you know that one third of all grandparents fund some part of their grandchild's life and almost 50% of them will buy the same products that their child purchases in their home for their home. So You know, right now I got go-go squeeze in my refrigerator because if my 18-month-old grandson comes over, I want him to have his go-go squeeze, right? We just had dinner with a couple and they have, I think, seven grandchildren, four locally. And that's exactly what the husband said. He said, Amazon comes every day with the blow-up pool and the this and the that. So when the grandkids come, right, we're spending money on them. Yeah, you know what? Um, it's kind of a sore subject with my sons, but my daughters, they love it. Um, my, I didn't want to be called grandma. And, um, and I just had two, my first two grandsons. And so my so grandsons, they call me spoiler. Like it started as a joke. I was like, no, don't call me grandma. Call me spoiler. And so every time I go to their house, I'm like, spoilers here. Well, now my 20 month old grandson has started to speak and he's like, it's spoiler, it's spoiler. And I'm like, uh oh, this might not be a good thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that though. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, but I think being over 50 is a great time in your life. I've reinvented myself so many times now since I've turned 50 that. It's an amazing time in your life. You sent over that you started your third company at 55. So tell us what that is. So I got my MBA when I was 50. And and while I was there, I would eat a lot of popcorn. I love popcorn and I have always owned the URL. I love popcorn.com, but never did anything with it. And um, my son was in Afghanistan. My daughter was in the Peace Corps in Africa and I was one worried mom. So I turned to my favorite snack, which is popcorn. And I was like, what can I do with popcorn that's different than sticking it in a tin can and trying to sell it? And I created a popcorn cake, uh, which is gluten-free. And I was like, okay, there's a lot of people who don't get to eat a birthday cake or have a birthday cake because, you know, they are gluten-free. And uh, I posted it to Facebook and I sold 400 in the first week and then ended up on Good Morning America the weekend that my daughter came home from Africa. And uh, I was like, hey, can you help me make 3,000 of these popcorn cakes? 
And um, long story <laughs> short, fast forward um, three years, and uh, we own Popalicious Popcorn now. We sell on QVC. We've been on Fox and Friends, and we just uh, two months ago opened our first retail store. So, congratulations! Very- where's Where's the retail store? It's in um, Pompano Beach, Florida, in South Florida. And um, okay. You know, there are moments, Christina, where I say to myself, I could be retired. I could be sitting at my beach house, but I feel like the journey's not over for me. And um, it's the scariest thing I've ever done, but I have to tell you, it's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done as well. So yes, I've started my third business and uh, my daughter runs it with her husband that she brought back from Africa. And um, they do the day to day and I do the back end marketing and business. So it works out well. And hopefully I'm creating a future for my children. Well, and that's something I owned a retail store for 10 years. So I, my heart is so full hearing you say that it was some of the best times of my life. Some of the hardest times of my life. I owned it with my best girlfriend and she lasted another 10 years. I sold to her. I'm like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. But you meet amazing people. And Mm -hmm. I would think you have a great opportunity to franchise this. Well, every time someone comes in the store, they ask, or not every time, but a lot of people ask me every day, like, is this a franchise? Like, can you franchise this? So you know, I never start a business without an exit strategy. So we'll see what I, I cooked up in that business plan. And maybe your expertise in marketing to moms might help a little with your popcorn business. <laughs> it certainly does. I can tell you that because I think about the occasions that a mom needs popcorn a lot more than most people. So yeah, we've got graduation popcorn and we have going to state, you know, to play in the playoffs popcorn. And we have a lot of things that uh, the typical popcorn store doesn't have. And I'm like you, I'm one of those people, I order popcorn by the case. Uh, So I can't wait to check out Popalicious and see, I'm sure there's some amazing things on your, I'm assuming you sell on a website also. We do, we do, popaliciouspopcorn.com. So no matter where you are, we, and And in the spirit of our military family, we will ship around the world to military institutions and, um, and we donate part of our profits to the same maternal health programs that the Peace Corps that my daughter served in. Um, We help fund those. Oh, I love that. They've got your family involved in giving back and... Uh, so what do you, I keep going back to this marketing to women over 55 and I, I, I'm using this to give us an, a bigger voice and I'm meeting amazing women that have magazines and other things to, to give that voice. But what do you think we can do? Like, what should we do to, you know, wake up these, these products and brands and hello, we're here. You know, we want stuff and we have money to pay for it. You know, I think you... So a long time ago, I used to write on a bracelet, what would a man do? Because men and women think differently, right? Yeah. And in business, men look at the bottom line a lot more than women. We tend to fall in love with our businesses and nurture them like a child. And we're a lot more tolerant of the mistakes and perhaps sometimes the red line on the bottom line. So you have to think like a man. And I think the way to do it is to continually tout actual numbers. What is the spending power of this group and where do they spend money and demonstrate that, um, you know, if, if you're in social media or if you're in PR, if you can quantify in some way, how much money is being spent by these women and their disposable income, money talks and eventually they will come to understand, understand that. I did a marketing campaign with LOL surprise dolls um, last year. And it was one of the funnest things because what we did was we did a split screen like this and we had the child, the grandchild teaching the grandmother how to unwrap an LOL doll. And it sold so many dolls that now LOL is like, okay, grandparents are a really important market. They buy. Sometimes, you know, the mom doesn't want all that stuff around the house. The grandparents bring it into the house, right? So sometimes it's better to target the, the over 50 crowd. 
It's interesting. You said when you talk numbers, they listen. Um, I actually get to do some fun stuff. I, I work red carpets mm-hmm. and get to interview people. And I had interviewed um, a movie producer and he actually owns a studio and we just kind of hit it off and had some conversation after dinner. And it was before I launched the podcast and I was telling him some of the numbers and he perked up like, he's like, I want to talk to you more about this. I was like, well, hold on. Let me, you know, let me launch it. Let me make sure people like it. I don't know that I want to partner right away with anybody on this. Um, maybe not a man, uh, but, uh, but it was really interesting when he heard the numbers, he, he was listening. Yes, absolutely. I mean, numbers, numbers talk. And I think even in the early days when I was trying to convince companies of the power of of moms, I had to bring it home for them. And I had to also show them the numbers. Like, I mean, moms are the largest consumer group in the United States, you know, and often you see brands run after, you know, oh, we're going to go after the Latino moms, or we're going to go after the LG community, or we're going to, and they, They just try to run after the next silver bullet when in reality, here we are, right? I mean, here we are. So, you know, if you point out that there's 30 million women over the age of 50 and they're spending X number of of minutes online or on Amazon, that's all very powerful. Hey, QVC would not exist if it weren't for women over 50. I can be. Exactly. I can attest to that because they order Popalicious popcorn. And when I am sending out my orders, it's 90% women. And I know that the viewers skew higher. So yeah, there's a lot of businesses that do appreciate, appreciate us. And now Martha Stewart, you know, Hey, Martha Stewart's yes. on the cover of Sports Hill. So we got a chance. <laughs> Was that great? And, and in one week's time, Jane Fonda was on the cover of People talking about she's living her best life in her 80s. And then we had Martha Stewart. It was, and I said, Oh, my timing for my podcast and all of this is coming out. I'm like, Oh, I think I'm really onto something. This is so great. Well, I've watched you like be on to the right thing for 20 years. So it doesn't surprise Thank me you. that you are. <laughs> on the right path, but it's always good when someone else validates it, like validates it. Right. <laughs> well, and I heard, and you probably know this. I, I talked to somebody who works with an anthrop, I think it's called like a human anthropologist or, and what he was telling me is that, so we have our generation and then you've got like the gen X and the gen Z. And then after that, like we're big population groups after that, because of technology, there's there's no big numbers in those groups. It changes so fast. So for marketers, for brands, for companies, you want to hold on to these large groups that you can. So women over 55 is a huge population that you can talk to all of them at once versus you've got to talk to a 23-year-old and then a 22-year-old and then a 21-year-old because they're all speaking different languages and hearing you differently. Right. And- If you look at the Gen X population, they're largely ignored like in a big way by media and by consumer product companies and advertising. They are kind of the generation that they weren't easily convinced. So they've kind of been written off. Interesting. Boomers and have always been appealing to marketers. So it only would make sense that they would stay appealing even as they're, they're aging. Right. Well, we'll get there. We will. Slowly but surely. We're going to hammer it home with talking to, I, I've just met the most amazing women in this podcast. And what I've really found, like listening to you, you got your MBA, you started your third company, but we're doing things more purposefully and with more intention. You know, how great you got to start a business of your favorite food. Come on, who buys I love popcorn.com? Yeah. <laughs> and hold on to it. I love that. But your daughter's running the company, and that must bring you so much joy. It does. And it also brings challenges because, you know, 
<laughs> my husband reminds me that a um, long time ago, he read the statistic, there's no more difficult relationship than between a mother and a daughter. And you add a business to it, it gets a little bit, but no, it's so fulfilling. And you're right. Don't we have the luxury now that we're over 50 to be more intentional? You know, I told my team yesterday at my marketing firm, I'm like, you guys, I don't need to make, I don't need any more toys in my life. I don't need any more property. I, everybody's got their college paid, you know, so I've been very blessed. And if I can just keep you guys employed and everybody work the hours they want, that makes me happy. And I don't need to build my business to a $10 million company. Right. You know, I've done that. Oh, that comes with challenges too. Right. Right. It does. Money's not everything. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Managing people. You know, I used to right. have 20 people and I'm perfectly happy now having 11, you know, so it's easier. So I had a coach ask me that once he said, what's your goal? And then he's like, you know, you can get there, but do you want to manage 20 people? I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah. That's not for no. me. I, I, I like that's... creative stuff. You know, I like yeah. thinking outside of the box. So, What are you working on? Something fun that you can talk about with your marketing company? You know, I'm actually working um, with a company called Active and Fit Direct and F, um, Active and Fit Now. And they do exercise program for women over 50. So it's kind of cool Yay. because I get to work with like a lot of TikTokers and Instagrammers who are women over 55 who are really into fitness. And yeah. I got to tell you, it kind of keeps me inspired um, to stay fit as well with them. But um, that's probably one of the really exciting things that um, I'm working on right now. That's awesome. And I have to say, I am the most fit and the healthiest I think I've ever been. So I'm a little sore, a little harder to get out of bed, can't see everything. But in terms of, you know, like my muscle tone and my, you know, like I walk every day, I do weights. Like I, f I feel really good. I feel much better. My thirties, I was wearing big clothes because I didn't want to show anything. And yeah, that's great. I think, I think we are pretty darn healthy yeah. and fit. This morning I was doing, I do um, beach body after I, mm -hmm. I cycle every morning and then I do my beach body workout. And I was noticing this morning, I'm like, okay, Sean T is telling me to get my leg up, but yeah, it's not getting up <laughs> as high as it used to when I was ready. Right. But I think, you know, as long as you acknowledge that and you embrace it, it's, you know, it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. That's the other thing I've noticed with all, you know, and of course with my girlfriends, but now interviewing, you know, business people and influencers and we don't care anymore. It doesn't matter. We're going to try it. Like I said, this podcast, if I can inspire one person, I've done my job. If it nobody listens to it, no big deal. I did something that brought me joy. I got to talk to amazing people, um, right. but it's not the end of the world anymore where you used to, you know, a I'm, you, I had businesses fail. I'm sure in all of your career, you've had things fail. Eh, oh, well. Right. But the failure, you learn. you're also wise enough to know that the failure made you who you are, you know, and, right. and there's some fulfillment out of that as well, knowing that, you know, you didn't lose the lesson in that journey. So, right. Exactly. And that's why I think this is going to inspire younger women too, mm -hmm. hearing from us. Uh, that I speak at colleges and mentor a lot of students at, at my alma mater. And when they hear my journey of where I started and where I am now, and they're like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, you guys, you you can, that piece of paper is just for a couple months. After that, you are you can do anything you want to do. Take the education, whether you went to college or not, take what you learn, your experiences and do what you love. Life is too short. Be happy. Yeah, I next week I'm getting on a plane. I'm going to Poland. I like it's so random, but I've always wanted to go to Poland and I was like, what am I waiting for? Like Love I'm just going to go. And um I told my husband, I just want to be on a train in Europe and I picked Poland cuz I've always wanted to go. So no, no expectations, but I I'm like what in the world am I waiting for, you know? 
Good for you. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up all of our podcasts, um, I ask all of our guests the same two questions. So what is your greatest accomplishment since you've turned 50? Oh, well, by easily, it's getting my MBA because that was really hard. Like I decided to go to University of Notre Dame and see if I could get wow. accepted because three of my children had been denied. So I applied and I got accepted the same day as my fourth child. And um, oh, that's great. I graduated in the same ceremony from the University of Notre Dame, but it was hard. I had to use my 10th graders economics book just to get through that class. Like your brain doesn't, there's a part that doesn't study anymore. <laughs> so that has right. been absolutely, um, and I would encourage anyone, gosh, it feels so good to learn again. It, whatever it is, just enroll. There's so many free college courses you can take. Just go and learn yeah. something. It, it feels so good once you get, get it kickstarted. We had another guest who talks about that too, that you need to learn something new every day or do something new every day to, to prevent dementia, to prevent Alzheimer's. You actually can by doing that. So I don't know that I'm going to do the MBA route, but <laughs> good for you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, and then our last question, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Woo. Um, well, in all likelihood, because normally when I put something out in the universe, I'm likely to have a PhD because I really like the outfits you get to wear when you get your PhD. I always wanted to be a doctor. So um, I would probably have a PhD and I will have probably sold my popcorn business either to my daughter or to someone else because that's the exit strategy that I created. So that's probably where I'll be. Good for you. Great, great ambition to have. And I have a feeling you're going to get that PhD. Well, thanks. Um, thank you, Maria, for joining us. It was really fun. Thank you so, so much. So appreciate you. Oh, well, thank you.